Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all. And uh, again, we are in this wonderful center of Seeds of Happiness. And I again feel like in a small hermitage, you can call this the Caves of Happiness, where we all share the Dharma tonight. And uh, the title is very simple. It's Mind and Mirror. And within Buddhism, there are many ways to formulate that, many ways to talk about that. And the moment we want to talk about that, we face a big paradox. And this paradox goes like this. What we aim to formulate with words cannot be put into words. What we want to put into forms we cannot put into forms. We can make many ideas, we can make many symbols, we can make many systems, but what is the ultimate foundation, the Alpha and the Omega of all this? As human beings, we have always been interested in that. In fact, nothing ever stops us from being interested in that. Some people call this the transcendental inclination, something that we want to explore no matter what. And indeed, in the past, people traveled thousands of kilometers on foot or on horseback just to get to a monastery and practice something which seemed not so practical for this world. So we humans are very interesting for many reasons. First of all, we look for something which cannot be sensed with your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and cannot be conceived with your mind and cannot be felt with your heart. Yet we strive for it. Yet we want something which can be make us become free from impermanence. And this struggle for freedom has always characterized us. That's why in so many traditions we look for something which is called the foundation of our existence. This kind of awakening is probably the most important experience you can have in your life. And it's not over with that experience. It's just another gate which you can go through so that you could change your direction in life based on your transcendental experience. In Asian wisdom, there's a saying, if you read one book, you have to take 10,000 steps. Here in the West, we changed that axiom into something like this. You take just one step and you can read 10,000 books. What do we do with all that knowledge? In the West, since we mistranslated Logos as the word, we believe that the word or knowledge precedes everything. But nature begs to differ. Nature functions differently. We humans believe that our knowledge precedes everything, and that's how creation came about. And in that sense, we never corrected this mistake. We always take knowledge first in the West and experience second. In Asia, it's still different. Although in the last couple of decades, they imported most of our lifestyle and ways of thinking. Traditionally, in Taoism and Buddhism, experience comes first. Then comes knowledge or articulation. When the Buddha attained enlightenment, he saw, he perceived, that the experience is so profound that for him it seemed impossible to put it into words. So that's why, at first, he decided not to teach. And then, as legend has it, a supreme god, Brahma, from the highest heaven came and requested that the Buddha would teach because there are people on earth whose eyes are covered only by a little dust. And then came the teaching of the Avatamsaka Sutra that if you want to understand the nature of this world, this universe, in fact, then perceive it as created by mind alone. And that kind of creation is nothing verbal. It's a direct creation of the mind whereby this whole world, this whole universe appears. And we are company in that. We are not alone with that. In fact, seven billion human beings are creating this earth and beyond concurrently at the same time. So how do we access this creation, 
The access point of this creation is this moment. It's very hard to believe that this moment contains everything about past, present, and future, time and space, humans and other beings, karma and dharma. That you don't have to go back to an ancient past or a fictitious future or a projected present. But at this moment you can access everything as is. Yet, when we look at the nature of our minds, the deeper our experience goes, the better we can believe this and use this. Uh, when the Buddha was young, he saw three facts about life. Impermanence, interdependence, and imperfection. Now, these are abstract concepts that most of us really didn't delve deep into. But what we do experience is emotional frustration, uh, insufficient thinking or too much thinking, resources that we don't have, unnecessary things that we do have, unresolved relationships, uncertain jobs, all kinds of phenomena that always propel us to go further. We can't stop. Why? Because time doesn't stop. The way we are in this body, human beings, we experience time in a linear sequence. One-dimensional time. It's one of the most brutal facts of life. As long as we are in this body, we have a linear experience of time. We have a three-dimensional experience of space. Again, due to the fact that we are in this body, with these senses, with this brain. And in space, you can turn back. You can even turn back in 2D. You can make somersaults in 3D. But you cannot turn back in 1D. And that's why you cannot reverse time. So once we are pushed by these conditions and circumstances, then we always ask, what is at the root of all this? How did this appear? How does all this disappear if it does? And then you have to see that you have to get through the impermanent layer of your thoughts, feelings, perceptions, impulses, and various forms of consciousness. And when you do that, you attain something. So once we are fed up with our impermanent and imperfect phenomena in our consciousness, we want to go further. We want to get to the root of it. And that's when we start to look. One of the biggest changes that human beings can make is instead of projecting things outside, complaining, expecting, wanting a miracle, you turn your attention inwards. You turn inside. And you start to look inside for solutions. It's the biggest change you can make. And the funny thing about that is that this is the only way you attain true freedom. Freedom has many definitions. But the spiritual freedom I'm talking about begins with insight into cause and effect. How your mind operates. How the world operates. Whether the law that governs you and another human being is the same law or different. Whether the law governing the world and your soul is the same or different. And when you look inside, you find things that you have never found before. And the moment you look, you find very, very interesting inconsistencies. Your thoughts go one way, your emotions go the other way, your speech says something, and your actions are also different. We call it the inconsistency or incongruity of the human personality. And yet, without that, we wouldn't be going forward. We wouldn't look for our way. We wouldn't look for the origin of our mind. So these inconsistencies and opposites, they are like the driving forces, the polarity between plus and minus, have and have not, happiness and unhappiness, suffering and enlightenment. These all act like in an electric engine, the plus and the minus, which spins the whole thing forward. If we didn't have these opposites, if we were totally peaceful, totally logical, totally loving and compassionate, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have taken this body, we wouldn't be on this earth, we wouldn't have fellow human beings with the same traits, basically, as us. 
So look at this. Once you realize the true situation we have, you stop complaining. You stop asking improductive questions. You really look at life and yourself as we are, trying to find a governing principle. And once you look inside, you ask this, what is this? Where do my thoughts come from? What is the source? Where do my emotions come from? What is the source? Where do my impulses come from? What is the source? So, in short, the question, what is this, is directed inwards. And if you keep it, you attain something very interesting. You already know that if something appears and disappears, then it's not what we are looking for. So what is it that sees impermanence? What is it that sees imperfection? What is it that sees interdependence? We call that a mind which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. But it's not a mirror like in your bathroom. It doesn't have glass or paint. Also, it's not like three-dimensional space. We have to use something imaginative, something circumspect, something indirect to describe something which, I already said, we cannot describe. Why? Because that's what describes. We cannot see it because that's what sees. We cannot hear it because that's what hears. And we cannot think it because that's what thinks. So, how do you get through these paradoxes? One of the toughest experiences is that no matter how clever you are, you do not attain the source of your thinking. No matter how emotionally intelligent you are, just by form formulating emotions, you do not attain the source of emotions. So, what do you need to do? Recall that, stop the movement, or stop the creation and annihilation cycle. And in Zen, we demonstrate it with this. When you hear this sound, your mind was before thinking. Just, da. Ah. Also, before feelings. Also, before the notion of past, present, and future. Many people get, get hooked on the hit, and they begin to like it. That's Zen! No, that's not Zen. <laughs> It's a way to demonstrate one moment. But Zen is us. Zen is our minds. Zen is the way, the way we use to get rid of our illusions, our attachments, our false identifications, and get down to the very simple and very clear root of our existence, which is a mind which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. I know, easier said than done. But once you take the first step, you only have to take one more step at a time, and another step, and another step, and not lose the question, not lose the direction. I want to give you a story about uh, the origin of this question. Uh, there was a great monk who later became the sixth patriarch. And uh, he was the sixth generation after Bodhidharma, who took Buddhism to China. And Bodhidharma lived a thousand years after the Buddha. He is not a well-known figure, which is a surprise. You would only find four Dharma speeches. Uh, it's translated into English beautifully, and it's really like fire. One of them is actually called Fire Sermon. It's uh, very, very direct. He's not mincing his words. He's not wasting his breath. He's putting everything directly on the table. And uh, due to his great work, uh, we have Zen as we know it, because by the time he went to China, the Buddhist sutras had been there for over 200 years, maybe even three. And it was a slow merge with Taoism. And the way Taoism and Buddhism merged can be seen as a result. This is Zen. Originally, the name in India was Jhana, the Jhana school of meditation, which literally meant absorption, becoming one, becoming clear, or attaining the true meaning, all of this together. So becoming one, becoming clear, attaining the true meaning or essence. When it went to China, the word became Channa. 
and then they chopped off the end, then Chan, Son in, in Korean, and Zen in Japanese. And this school took very interesting turns over history. The sixth generation, as I've said, after Bodhidharma was Hui Nang. He was a very unusual person. He was 17 years old when he was selling firewood at the local market to support his mother. And he was a very simple boy, illiterate. But he heard a monk reciting two lines of the Diamond Sutra on the marketplace which said, don't attach to anything which arises in the mind, the one who perceives like this becomes Buddha. He heard that, boom, woke up, got enlightenment. So then he asked this reciting monk who was actually begging on the market, it was standard practice. You recite teaching and people support you. That's how it worked for centuries. So he asked the monk, Elder brother, where is the monastery where you practice? Then he went to the fifth patriarch's temple and he became an apprentice in Korean Hengja. So he worked for the temple and he was uh, proving that he would be suitable for ordination. But even before that, there was a contest within the monastery. The fifth patriarch said, everybody must demonstrate their knowledge of the Dharma so that I could appoint my successor. And the head monk, Shen Siu, was considered the most erudite, the most experienced, the most eloquent of all. So Shen Siu wrote a poem on the wall of the monastery and he says, the body is Bodhi tree, the mind is the stand of a clear mirror. Always clean, clean, clean. Never let dust settle. So everybody looked at that poem and says, Wonderful! I am sure, they said, that Shen Siu will become the sixth patriarch. So, Hui Neng, who was not Hui Neng at that time, he was just No Hengja. His Dharma name was Hui Neng later. Uh, he asked uh, a friend of his, Please read this for me. I really want to know what it means. And uh, after he learned the meaning, he says, Wow, could you please write something for me on the, on the wall? He says, You? You're not even ordained. You're just an apprentice. You're not even a novice, let alone these re revered bhikkhus of many, many years of practice. What do you want? And then Nohang just said, Please, just four lines, one by one, next to it. If it's bad, I will apologize, but please give me a chance. So his friend wrote what Nohang just said. Bodhi has no tree. Clear mirror has no stand. Originally nothing. Where is dust? So the fifth patriarch saw that and he goes up to the wall and everybody says, who is this? What is this weird thing? We don't like that. So he grabs his shoe and he clears off No Hang Just poem, says, this is garbage. And everybody was really surprised and they were waiting for the ceremony next day because nobody else competed. So it was going to be Shen Siu. But as No Hang Just returns to working with rice, pounding rice. You can see it on the walls of many Korean temples. All this story is in great paintings. So he returns to pounding rice at the corner of the monastery and the fifth patriarch goes there. Nohangja looks at him, doesn't say a word. Why? In those situations, you don't speak until spoken to. So the fifth patriarch also didn't say a word, just looked at him <laughs> and hit the stand with his stick three times. And then he puts his hand behind his back and walk away. So that means the third hour after the bell for sleeping, come to me through the back entrance. 
And uh, all this was uh, very clear for Hui Neng, because if they didn't have mind-to-mind -mind contact, then there is no transmission, then there's nothing to transmit to no one. So he goes in there and Fifth Patriarch says, you should leave. You know, you will be the Sixth Patriarch. But you should bide your time and be patient and seek ordination when circumstances grant that. Here's the Buddha's ball, here's the Buddha's robe. So for 34 generations, until Huineng, the sign of transmission was the ball of the Buddha and the kasa, the robe of the Buddha. It was a very sacred relic. Huineng bowed and left. In the morning, instead of ceremony, there's a shock. Fifth Patriarch says, I'm not giving transmission. That, what's going on? You know what spreads faster than light? Gossip. <laughs> so it's very soon, very soon, they found out that this thing happened. Because no Hengja was nowhere. His poem was nowhere. Transmission was nowhere. So you do the math. Suddenly, these strong monks, they said, let's get him. <laughs> so they started to chase him. There was a monk called He Myung, and he was a former military. It was customary in China at that time, even after and before, but especially during the almost 400 years of the Tang Dynasty, where Buddhism was extremely popular, extremely well-funded, extremely supported. That military people, once they are done, and they, for some reason they don't want a wife or children, they go to a monastery and they practice until they die. And uh, they had a goodish 20, 30 years after their service was over, uh, and uh, they had pretty good perspective. They had discipline, they had wisdom, they did pretty bad things, so they had some remorse. So <laughs> some kind of practice was appropriate. But Hei Myung got back to his old self and started to chase the, the sixth patriarch with a few friends and he got way ahead of them. By next day, he caught him. He was a tracker. He was very experienced. It's like you trying to escape from a commando. You can't. So the sixth patriarch, who was not yet the sixth patriarch, just an escapee running for his life, he saw that Hei Myung is catching up with him. So he put the robe and the ball on the rock and hid himself. Hei Myung gets there and as legend has it, as he touches the robe and the ball, he can't move them. He just can't. As if they were fused with the rock. Then he gets really, really frightened. And he says, younger brother, I don't want to hurt you. I didn't come here for the robe and the bow. I came here for the Dharma. Now, if you were Hui Neng, would you have trusted that guy? Well, Hui Neng did. So he came out and um, Hei Myung actually bowed to him and said, please teach me. He says, when you don't think of good and bad, what is your original face? Hei Myung heard that and boom, got enlightenment. So he attained this clear-like space, clear-like mirror consciousness, at least for one moment, when everything was gone. No self, no world, no dualities, everything gone. Yet, something that we cannot put into words was there. For lack of a better term, the Buddha called this vidya, or seeing, or perceiving. From the same word comes videre, you all know that, and video. Then when He Myung went through that experience, he said, let me become your student. And watch this. Sixth Patriarch says, no, no, no. I really cannot be your teacher. If you have a mind like this, then we are both the students of the Fifth Patriarch. It was amazing. He didn't annex him. He didn't occupy him. He didn't conquer him just because the person became vulnerable and actually elevated him seemingly to the same rank as him, we call it emancipation. And then they went on their way, and the man was happy, not feeling deprived. But actually he lost. 
he lost a lot of things, which we have to be prepared on our path. But in Buddhism, you can only lose your illusions. Even the dearest illusion, you lose. And even the toughest piece of reality stays with you. So the origin of our Huadu, or our question, is this sentence. When you don't think of good and bad, what is your original face? So it became shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And the question now goes just, what is this? And that's what we use to look inside. We have other meditation techniques as well, like perceiving the sounds or reciting a mantra. And all these three we will be experiencing and practicing tomorrow, just a couple of floors above. Why? If we don't do it, it's not worth much. Everybody is listening very intelligently and compassionately tonight. That's wonderful. Well, what, what happens tomorrow? You certainly don't sit for another Dharma talk. You're not such a masochist. So what do you do? What kind of steps do you make? So as simple as it is, this kind of clear mirror consciousness, which has no I, no ego, no dualities, no past, no present, no future, to that extent our habits control it, or seem to control it. We love our habits. In fact, these habits and the energy, the habit force that they contain, that's what makes us feel alive. Imagine that you take all the habit force out. No habits, but also no energy. That's the way it seems to your logic. But that's not the way it works. In fact, the more you lose your habits, the more energy appears. It's like splitting an atom. The more the atom loses itself, the more energy appears. So you sit in, in meditation, sometimes you feel direct heat. It's just your chi, you know, boiling a little bit. But that's not exactly what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is your mind's energy, the potential to recreate yourself, to reform your life, to be the human being you truly aspire to be. That all comes from this energy released from your habits. Now look at your most critical moments in life. The suffering that you had to go through so many times. What did that do to you? It forced you to change. It forced you to release energy. It forced you to change your habits. It forced you to lose your self-image. How about doing that without the suffering? just with your own correct motivation. Perceiving how this life actually is, how this world operates, how we operate as human beings, and use your best sense to have a path, to have a strategy, to have something more meaningful and more transcendental than just living for the senses. That's our potential. We call that Buddha nature, or in this place you would call it bodhicitta. But it doesn't matter what you call it. The question is, do you recognize it? Do you use it? Or you don't? Because in fact, this potential is exactly what makes us different from animals. And don't get me wrong, animals are cute. I've just seen a wonderful little dog, cutest thing on earth. I think, actually, personally, dolphins are way more intelligent than human beings. They never had wars. They never had genocides, they never depleted the seas, they never changed the climate. They actually help each other and funnily enough, they also help us if we let that happen. They actually never sleep, but half of their brain always sleeps. They, they communicate from a distance that we cannot even perceive and they never make a mistake in that sense. When we kill them with our sonars and whatever we do under the sea, then they die but they actually don't kill each other. So it's really a fantastic society if you look at it from a human perspective. But they don't look at it from a human perspective because they can't. They just do it. They have no alternative. They couldn't become any better or worse. It's just their consciousness and their body together 
doing all this. So if we have this clear mirror reflective mind, the capability of perception, something that is atemporal, going beyond time and space, that's exactly what makes us specifically and tragically human. Animals don't have this. They don't have that center open in their minds. We have that. We can reflect. We have history. We have art. We have music. We have tragedies and comedies. We have words. We have forms. We do things that are really not necessary for life on this earth, but it's necessary for us, without which we wouldn't feel complete. We wouldn't be expressing ourselves. So what is it that is so specifically human? Through all these channels, you get down to the very bottom of it, to the very core of it, and it's this clear mirror reflecting mind which can see, which can hear, which can understand and feel and think. Now, how do we use that? You look at human civilization on Earth and the sum total is tragic. It's absolutely dismal. The same tool with which we could create a sustainable economy on Earth, we are destroying the Earth. The same tool which we could use to have a balanced society with local identity and global perspective is totally disintegrating human society on Earth by having a few thousand of the elite and billions down there in the dust. The same potential. We have no other tool, but it either goes up or down, either creates suffering or creates happiness. Like I said in the introductory, we do not have a choice over time. We are changing. And if we put a correct direction to this change, then we can go to the way of awakening and helping each other, or darkening and killing each other. It's our choice. But we will go through it anyway. If you look at your own karma, it's not really predictable what kind of food you will eat next week, next month, next year. Most likely we will have food to eat. But as humanity, it's different. It's very predictable how much food we consume every month as human beings. It's measured, it's statistically coded, we know it. Also, we know how much this, this earth can supply on land, on sea, and from the air. So with this knowledge of cause and effect, what can we possibly do? And the answer is, not much. There are various groups in society that don't listen to each other and don't genuinely connect to each other. And one example is climate change. Scientists have been conclusive about this since the mid-70s. Since the mid-70s, the elite understood that there is climate change which is reversible, but it's very, very hard work. And until the first decade after the year 2000, there was not much done. Even now, there's not much done, and more than a quarter of a century passed. What were we waiting for? And the answer is, we were waiting for the suffering that cannot be avoided. So how many tornadoes and hurricanes and landslides and earthquakes and all this and tsunamis do we need to understand that we need to change something? And the answer is we may not have had enough as a species. We may have to experience more. So please decide what you do with your own karma, what kind of direction you take with your life and how you use this ultimate tool of clear mirror consciousness. Your true mind, your true nature, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. I'm giving you real-world examples to connect these two. The seemingly abstract and philosophical, and the causative and actual. In fact, they are not operating in two different realms, or under two different sets of laws. It's the same world, it's the same law. And this law in Sanskrit is called Dharma. That's why we study it. Dharma means the actual rules of operation, how we function as human beings with our thoughts, feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness. 
and how this world functions with the five elements of fire, metal, wood, earth, and water. So, if we use our minds correctly, we live a correct life. If we do not use our minds correctly, we live an incorrect life. And that you can see for yourself. Nobody has to judge from the outside. And when you see it in yourself, then you see cause and effect, then you can take responsibility. And like I've said, the only way to true human freedom is taking responsibility. Because then you say, it's my job, my action, my speech, my emotions, my words. I've done that. And when you do that, then, slowly, slowly, step by step, you attain the freedom of choice. That's what we want. We want free choice. But if you don't look inside and exercise that inside, we will never have it. Because nothing and no one will give you this free choice from the outside. You have to attain it inside first. And that's what leads you to freedom. And then comes the correct use of freedom, which means you do not attain it for yourself. You want to help other beings to wake up and make that conscious choice for themselves. And funnily enough, that's what some people are afraid of. Afraid to give it and afraid to take it. What happens if everybody can make their own choice? Well, we would have a much more enlightened society. A much, much better life. Why? We humans, as improvised as we are, to that extent we are predictable. It's very predictable that humans want to move away from suffering and towards happiness. That line, that one-dimensional line alone is enough to predict what we would do with our free choice. Once we realized the Dharma, once we realized cause and effect, that if I hurt you, I hurt myself. If I cause harm to the outside, I cause harm to the inside as well, and vice versa. So with the correct understanding of the Dharma, with the correct attainment of our true nature, we could do wonderful things. But as long as our minds are clouded with dualistic ideas as the Absolute, as long as we subscribe to dogmas and orthodox views, and if we don't see what is right obviously in front of us, we create our own karma called destiny. Why destiny? Because you believe you cannot change it. The moment you abdicate your choice, your karma becomes your destiny. The moment you consciously choose, your destiny becomes your potential. So I think this is plenty for introductory, and now I would be Honored and happy to answer your questions. Aren't all uh, religions and cults trying to uh, to um, to get in the same place? No, actually not. If you look at the West, we have three major monotheistic religions okay. and several versions within. And each of them has their own sets of writings or scriptures. And they all want people to believe them unconditionally, saying untested. And some people do need them, some people believe them and follow them. And some people feel that it's just insufficient. In a way it's too much, from another aspect it's too little. So. That's why I said the West always put knowledge before experience and always pushed people to believe that instead of experiencing it themselves. I want to mention two names, Giordano Bruno, who got burnt in Rome on a bridge because he believed his own eyes and ears. Next, a hundred years later, Galileo Galilei, who almost got burnt, but he was a little bit smarter and waited until he died naturally, to say, yet it moves. And what was that about? Well, it was these little pieces of glass and a barrel called a telescope. And through this telescope, you could actually see something which was not in the scriptures. In fact, it was totally 
a new territory. You looked into it, and you saw it for yourself. That was a problem. That was 1600. That was 400 years ago, people. Not such a long time. So turn your telescope inwards and see. It's the biggest change you can make. Okay? Then you find your own things, your own dogmas, your own orthodox views. Orthos is the established and doxa is knowledge. Established knowledge. That's what I meant. Dogmatic also comes from, from Greek, means unquestioned. Zen means you ask questions. Zen means you don't depend on established knowledge. You depend on your experience. And then you cleverly use the established knowledge to articulate that and communicate that in your own way. That's much more fun. Yes, thank you. You're I welcome. guess, I don't know, I guess people just uh, understand the uh, dogmas, I don't know, they take it too liter literally, I... How about you? Do you do that too? No. Lucky. Thank you. You're welcome. Hang on, over there, please. Let's see if I understand correct when you said uh, that the first is the mind and after the emotion, when you use that stick, I understand correctly that you think and suggest that first is the thought and after comes the emotion. I didn't understand correctly. I didn't mean that. Okay. First comes this moment of no name, no form, no life, no death, no creation, no destruction. It's this moment. Only perceive. Then you can see your thoughts and emotions and everything. But it's not in this order, like switch one, switch two, switch three. I, I just cannot say everything at the same time. One mouth, one word. Yeah, it's my limitation, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. You have the same problem, too. Uh, one mouth, one word at a time. My master, Zen Master Sung Sai, used to say, imagine that human beings would have two mouths. One for eating and the other for everything else. That would be terrible. Why? Because when they stop eating, they would start talking. Then they, they would talk with two mouths. Complete tragedy. So it's not an order. It's just a list. But the order is not determined. It can be the other way around. It can be simultaneously. The way they appear actually is so fast that by the time you count them, it changed ten times over. One big experience is when you look inside, and you pass your worries, concerns, to-do lists, aversions, personal vendettas inside, when you pass them, then you actually see how your mind operates, how you put together your reality, how quickly you muster your emotions and thoughts and past and present and future and what you saw, heard, tasted, smelled, all this. It's really like a bunch of sparks in your neural system, you know, and it's way faster than 24 frames a second. That's why it's so hard to believe that it's made, that it's not solid, okay? So, Thank you. quantum physics helps, but you still have to attain inside something. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Yes. I wanted to ask you if it's okay for me to ask for a nice guy for love, let's say. Yes. A man, let's say. I'm straight, I guess. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> how do you propose to do that? So how would you ask? Just that we are clear about the method. Oh. Uh, Oh, I would kindly ask. Who? Uh, the presumed bigger mirror. The universe. Okay, universe, let's stay with that. It's kind of an unbreakable concept. Yes, the universe. The universe. And you would ask the universe for a nice guy. Yes. <laughs> um, Have you done that before? 
Yes. Did it work? Uh, yes. Then why ask again? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, only par partially. I guess I had some bad experience with the good experience and the bad experience taught me some some lesson. I guess I had to to learn. And the guy was nice, but not, not that nice. I don't okay. know. <laughs> so <laughs> I have just uh, one piece of advice. Look inside and make yourself more suitable for attracting this nice guy. So if you mm -hmm. change yourself, then the guy also changes. But if you have the same vibes, you get the same guys. <laughs> Thanks. True? Yes, it's true. So if you change yourself, you change your partner as well because your attraction field works differently. That's Thank about you. it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank Next question. My question is, um, you said that there is something specific uh, to humans and I think it was uh, the mind, right? The mind which reflects. This reflective mirror consciousness, that seems to be it. Yeah. Um, what is uh, specific to this mind other than language? Because you said that for, for Greek people, for ancient Greeks, they tended to equate the mind with language and that this has carried on through tradition. Uh, so, is there anything else other than uh, language? Well, there's a lot more to it. In fact, everything is reflected in it, not just your concepts, your preconceived ideas as well, before you put them into words. All your thoughts, all your emotions, all your experiences of past, present and future. And at this point, I would like to help out by briefly describing the Buddhist model of consciousness. Our therapist colleagues and friends will probably rejoice hearing that. So we have the first five senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, as such. And then we have the sixth, which is thinking mind. It's your CPU. That's where your concepts, analyses, everything happens, your arguments. That's conceptual mind. The next one is what, the seventh, is what we call judgmental mind, when your distinctions and judgments and dualities appear. Is the zero and one mind, the good and bad mind. Also the blue and green and red mind, but if you use it correctly, it is distinctive, it makes distinctions. If you use it incorrectly, it passes judgments, most of them unfounded. And the eighth is your hard drive, is your memory. Long-term memory as well, not just the subconscious, folks, all your lives, everything. You've ever experienced and identified with. It's very important. If you experience something and you don't think about it with the sixth, you don't judge it with the seventh, there's no identification and it leaves the eighth doesn't become long-term memory. In fact, if you reverse the process, you remove the identification, remove the judgment, remove the active cognitive process from it, in other words, you take the energy out of it, the trauma can disappear. It can. It will be there as an imprint in the memory without the traumatic uh, experience. So, so three more than animals, right? So everything from concepts to... No, animals have all this. They actually proved from various angles with various species that uh, seemingly re remote locations you change the behavior of some monkeys and then the other monkeys on the island followed. Or something happened with birds <clears throat> and hundreds of kilometers away, the birds of the same species followed. Means they share the same eighth consciousness. And uh, they also decide very clearly what's species and not, what is friend, what is enemy, what is poison, what is food. It's all coded. 
it's all coded. We humans, we don't understand nature because our consciousness is more complex. And the sixth is also something that animals can use. In fact, it's not just when you train them to point at triangles and squares and all that. But animals think. They think very well with their own, compared to us, seemingly limited CPUs. They think. They form concepts, except they don't verbalize them. And they have a concept of owner for a dog or enemy of a dog. And it's identified with smell and movement and eye color and all kinds of stuff. So they have all the eight. But what they don't have is the mirror that perceives all the eight levels of consciousness. Don't call it the ninth. It doesn't have a number. It doesn't reside in any one of us specifically. That's why I said these mirrors are actually not separate. At that level, we are not separate. But we are responsible for our own karma. So don't think that the other mirror can reflect yours. They reflect it bad enough. Why are you such an animal? That's a reflection you should listen to. But you can only solve your own homework. So your mirror reflects your karma. But we are connected at that level superbly. And it is not even the collective subconscious. It's deeper even that. Collective subconscious is also karma. But this clear mirror consciousness is not karma. It's not dependent on anything. That's why it's unbreakable. And if you get to it and practice it, it becomes yours again. In fact, you're never separate from it. But you can forget it if you listen too much to your thinking, if you're attached to your emotions too much, if you are attached to the sensory perceptions, then you lose it. You forget it. But originally, you can't lose that. You can't live without it. You wouldn't be human without it. It can get covered up pretty bad. We've seen that. But uh, likewise, using your free will, your free choice, you can get back there. Thank you. You're welcome. It's a follow-up question. Can you describe please uh, further the eighth level, the eighth consciousness. Are you a therapist too? No. Mm. It's a little easier. I don't have to be so specific. So, would you like me to repeat it? Or describe CPU. it further? I got, got the CPU idea. Okay. That like the seventh is the controller. It. On a logic right. board, you have controllers. Some signals go this way, go that way. This equation, that equation. These are the controllers. They're also these little chips. And with the seventh, that's where you make I and no I. Mother and other women. Father and other men. So that's where the seventh consciousness learns to distinguish between the protected area of self and the unprotected and sometimes very hostile area of the world. Why? Defense. Basic instincts of survival. You don't distinguish that, you don't survive. And later on, if you don't distinguish between what you want to possess and what you want to discard, you also cannot survive. And later on, you also distinguish between aspects of procreation and also not procreation. These are the three basic instinct groups that we have and we follow. Survival, possession, procreation. Now to see that, you need this clear mirror mind. So I hope all of us will be practicing together at some point, maybe tomorrow. And I want to thank you very much for your precious attention. And I hope that we all attain uh, a higher state, a more enlightened state of, of mind and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.